Right. So we are midway in our uh, inspection of this tutorial on real time or reverse time migration. And what we uh, see now is really the essence of um, what uh, happens in reverse time migration. You take a uh, source at a point and you extend a wave field from that, which in this constant velocity uh, 2D field here, um, we get of a, uh, a source wave field reconstruction, which of course is just a cone in constant velocity. But you know, however you do the reconstruction, that, that wave field will be more complicated. And notice that it's just the direct um, p from that source in this case. There's no, you know, that that source, that reconstructed source wave field does not include any reflections, diffractions, uh, uh, anything else. It, it will include ray bending, you know, Snell's law through velocity boundaries, where you include the velocity boundaries in your um, in your model. We just call that the down going wave field. But you see uh, uh, at the uh, at the edges here, you know, impacting on steep dip reflectors, it's left and right going. It's not down going at all. Um, so uh, it's a uh, um, we call it wave field continuation. You know, we let the the direct P wave go wherever it goes, um, and it could be now. Of course, if you you could do this re, this this wave field reconstruction with a a one way down going wave equation, you know that being one very reasonable implementation of of RTM, and then you know the uh, the vertically well the horizontally propagating parts of this would vanish, right? According to the strength of the uh, one-way wave equation you're using, and and you would just have uh, you know the approximate approximated semicircle going down. So you could you could do it do it uh, with a down going only wave. Uh, but look um, look at what happens uh, here um, now on the right hand side on the uh, receiver side. We've taken that shot gather. Uh, which you can see the shot gather, you know, that's the slice that's here. It's at the at z equals zero and all time, right? So the time slice that's the top of the cube on the right, that's the shot gather, and you can see these two diffractions that are in the shot gather. And um, we've talked about how uh, I, I think I agree with you. It's absolutely impossible, you know, with this model at constant velocity to produce. A uh, reflection from that, uh, or a diffraction from that dipping um, interface that comes out in front of the of the shallower uh, reflection. So uh, that's an error in Sava's uh, tutorial here. Um, still, it's it's illustrative, um, you know, and and really what we're doing here is we're taking whatever diffractions do exist in the data, and we are reconstructing. A cone, you know, we're taking that diffraction, whatever we have, however it looks, and certainly you could imagine data sets, and maybe you've seen data sets where where you have these crossing diffractions in the shot gather. Okay, and and then whatever it is, you know, here again with constant velocity and you know no um, no uh, um, um, uh, no reflections or, or further, you know, secondary diffractions, um, with the possibility of ray bending, you know, due to Snell's law, um, and and velocity gradients. Okay, so uh, we we take that diffraction and we reconstruct uh, that whole uh, that whole cone, and you see here in this case, and maybe uh, I think that's what's shown here. Um, you know, looking at this blue one here, you can see it's cut off. Uh, the downgoing waves are cut off, so you know it should be a full cone, right? We should see it extending down below. Uh, so this is just using an upgoing wave equation. So that's an example where the uh, uh, the reconstruction is done uh, with just a one-way wave equation. Um, and uh, uh, maybe it also points out that that you don't have to use the same reconstruction method. 
on the source as you do with the receiver. You can use different methods. Obviously, if you're using one-way equations, you want to use a downgoing one for a standard seismic survey. You want to use a downgoing one on the source and an upgoing one on the receiver side. Um, and and you could you know um, the thing that you have to keep the same, uh, or it's obviously not going to work, is you know the velocity model has to be the same. You know, otherwise it's obviously not going to match. It's not going to work. Um, okay, with another exception though, let's say I wanted to do an RTM of um, of p to s conversions, then I would use a p velocity model, you know, on downgoing waves from the the source and an s velocity model on upgoing waves from the receiver. So, you know, whatever velocity models you use, they have to contribute to a a you know, kind of rational uh, imaging condition, right? So uh, that's uh, um, that I think is is required. Okay, so so we are, and and you'll note that the the points on the cone, you know, are pointing to just the uh, normal incidence reflection points on each of the each of the reflectors. Um, but that's we're going to use way we're going to we're going to get way more than that out of this shot gap. Okay, and and that's because we don't stop here, just identifying where the cones poke into the the zero uh, time plane, you know, in x and z, right? We could stop here and say, well, that's our migration. We've we've imaged the the normal incidence reflection points, and we're done. Okay, and if you have if you have zero offset data, uh, then that's where you would stop, right? We talked about that plenty in seven oh six, but we have multi offset data, and we we want to Reconstruct more of these reflectors from this shot gather than just the uh, the, ze the the zero offset uh, reflection uh, depth points. So um, we use a, a very special imaging condition, okay, and uh, this is called the WSRWR model. So it's source wave field reflectivity. Um, Receiver wave field model, and that's basically so. So we're the essence here of um, uh, you know, especially considering these cones here. So far, this is nothing more than what we've already covered, you know, with respect to um, uh, semicircular superposition, Kirchhoff migration, uh, or or the one way. Uh, Wave equation migrations, uh, like the finite difference migrations we did back in 706. Here is where we're taking a big departure, okay, with the imaging condition. So here's a, a statement of the imaging condition, and this is uh, quoted pretty much straight out of Sava's and, and Hill's tutorial. The scatterer exists at the spatial coordinate at the x and z, okay, so we're looking at the x and z planes here in the fronts of these cubes that contains coincident non-zero wave field amplitudes in both the source and the receiver wave fields. OK? So uh, let's take a look at, at uh, the, uh, uh, again, this is a, the same cube. We've got the, uh, uh, we've got the, uh, um, the red source wave field. We've got the blue and, and uh, green receiver wave fields. And we're going to take these sections through them. OK? So um, the horizontal section here uh, in salmon color is uh, at a particular non zero depth z. Um, what is it called? It's called z star. OK? And there's this orange. Slightly different from salmon, but there's this orange uh, vertical plane, which is taken at the uh, the location x star. Okay, and so that's the point. You know, we want to look at that x star and z star, and we want to say, okay, what can we image there under this imaging condition? Okay, so now we have the same sections drawn through the receiver. Wave fields, wave field, okay, the WR sub R, 
All right, it's at the same x. There's a plane here at the same x star, and the, a plane, a flat plane here at the same z star. Okay, and uh, all right. So the uh, the source wave field um, uh, at that uh, uh, on those planes is is uh, is 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 zero almost everywhere, right? The source wave field is very simple. It's very impulsive, right? It's just this thin sheet, okay, of a of a delta function basically, in uh, in time. And um, but uh, uh, you know, along this uh, z star constant z star plane, you here's the uh, hyperbola. That is the intersection of that z, the, that z star plane with the uh, the source wave field cone, and then there's a um, um, there's a uh, another uh, hyperbola on the on the uh, on this other plane, which is at uh, x star. The vertical plane is at this constant x star, okay, and and there's another hyperbola on that, okay, and you can see that they're both uh, Coming in right there, where there's this little uh, 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 staple there, uh, that yellow staple that uh, identifies where uh, um, you know if we if we look back into it at all times, right, back into the uh, the the source wave field volume at all times at that x star and z star, we're right at the intersection of those two planes, right, and uh, we're looking here. We got zero 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 zero. Oh, we get to the Yellow staple. We're intersecting the plane non-zero right there at uh, yellow, and um, and uh, uh, and then behind that uh, at further times zero 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 and so forth. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, we look at the uh, at the receiver wave field at the same coordinate. Got the same planes, the same salmon plane at z star, and the same orange plane. Vertical at uh, x star, constant x star, and uh, it at uh, on the z star plane, we see again two hyperbolas. Okay, and uh, and there's also two um, hyperbolas on the x star plane. And uh, you know we just picked what x star and z star we want to look at, and as we go. Um, uh, you know, from time t equals zero, there's there's no amplitude, no amplitude, no amplitude, and then we uh, we come to a yellow staple where we we intersect the blue um, uh, source wave field or receiver wave field reconstruction, and then uh, there's some more zeros, and then we we come to another yellow staple where uh, we're intersecting the uh, the green um, source wave receiver wave field reconstruction, and then zeros after that. Okay, so we we notice here we've got two time series, right? We've reconstructed the the wave fields, source and receiver wave fields, into this whole volume. So we got two time series now, and um, and and for this simple model, you know, simple co model, constant velocity, only two reflections, uh, constant velocity. You know, the source wave field reconstruction is uh, non-zero only at this one time. And the receiver uh, uh, wave field reconstruction at this x star z star, you know, along this time series here, this, we've got a second time series, and it's non-zero only at um, these two points where the two reflections intersect. That uh, the re two reconstructed reflections, re uh, uh, receiver wave fields, uh, intersect that um, um, that point. Now I spoke too soon. Because I, I I said reflections. No, these are reconstructed wave fields. They're just direct waves from these diffracting points, okay? And and it's this imaging condition that that says, oh, is this a reflection? I mean, as you can see, every every single, you know, there is some wave field in every part of this volume. You know, we could pick any combination of x star and z star, and um, and we can find uh, uh, we can find a, 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 a reconstructed wave, you know, source to receiver at, at different times, you know, many different times. But if it uh, 
uh, for it to represent a reflection, okay, we have to have non-zero wave reconstructed wave field amplitudes at the same time in both the source and receiver reconstructed wave fields. Okay, let's see. So, so what this is basically saying is, you know, back to to that. Uh, uh, and, and this does apply uh, to this case. Uh, remember when we were coming up with an imaging condition for uh, in this class for um, non-zero offset data, right? We use a downgoing uh, one-way wave equation to to project the uh, uh, to project the uh, the source uh, the waves from the source, and we use an upgoing uh, wave field to project the. Uh, Actually, we used a downgoing wave field to project from the uh, the virtual uh, sources at the receivers, you know, down to the reflection points, and where uh, where the uh, amplitudes were coincident in time, in that case at t equals zero, and coincident uh, in space at h equals zero. That's where we found our imaging condition, and this is the same imaging condition. Reflectors exist where incident and reflected wave fields. Are coincident in time and space. So they're coincident in space if they're if if we can find the downgoing source wave field uh, at the um, at this x star z star, and it happens at this particular time. Call it one second, okay? And the uh, uh, and and here's the same you know spatial location x star z star in the receiver wave field. Right, and so the question is: Is there, you know, is one of these non-zero points along the uh, along that time series at x star z star in the reconstructive receiver wave field, is that non-zero at at uh, uh, time uh, at that once at that same one second where we found the non-zero source wave field at that spot? Okay. So. Uh, um, uh, that's the uh, that's the essence of the uh, imaging condition. WS and WR coincide. You know, they are are uh, uh, both. They they have to both be non-zero at that time t. Okay. All right. There's only one point here in the source wave field where we have non-zero um, amplitude, and that's at uh, that's at Say one second, okay. And uh, if if this these two isolated non-zero points in the receiver wave field, if they're at point uh, five, if they're at uh, um, you know one point two seconds and one point four seconds, well, then we've missed it. There's no there's no reflector at that location x star z star, okay. However, if this point, and it looks like it is, if that point is also at one second, then that means that we can reconstruct, right? We can say, oh, you know, the uh, uh, the source and the receiver wave fields coincide in time and space, and therefore that's a reflector. Okay. Basically, you do a cross correlation, and then yeah. So how are you going to determine that, right? You you just you have two time series here. You you get the zero lag cross correlation, and and if it's zero, there's no reflector there. If it's uh, if it's non-zero, then that's the that's an estimate of the reflection coefficient. Yeah, so it's not it's not a normal cross correlation. Well, it's not it's you. Kind of a, it's it's it's, it's it's really just a dot product, right? Yeah. We're not getting cross correlations at a at a whole range of lags, so we're not uh, we're just getting that uh, uh, correlation coefficient. But what about I mean most reflection data you're going to have multi cycles all the way down the whole record. So how do you define? So so that's that's where you know you rely on the cross correlation to do its its magical um, match filtering job. And produce high amplitudes where those really do, you know, you really do have the same, um, the same waveform at the same spot, and and then where they're out of phase, where the two, you know, 
so each of these time series, right, this one on the source wave field and this one on the receiver wave field, right, they're both very complicated and they both got waves going all over the place, but where they're out of phase, right, the cross correlation is going to yield something low, but when they do come in phase, right, then the cross correlation is going to give you a, a strong, a strong, uh, uh, you know, non-zero uh, amplitude. I guess I'm just thinking in a cycle. Right. So, so you know, like all mesh filtering, if your if your if your um, bandwidth is too narrow, you're going to have a lot of trouble with this, right? You know, it's it's going to right because because you take two you know you take random sinusoids of random um, of of random uh, phase and random frequency and random amplitude. And you just cross correlate ten million of them, you'll find that your average coefficient correlation is like sixty-seven percent. Um, so, so yeah, you know, uh, uh, notice that that this example that works perfectly here—that's an infinite bandwidth, an infinite frequency uh, example. You know, to to have a spike, you've got to have infinite bandwidth, and and there. It works perfectly, and you can understand that the, the coefficient of correlation is going to be the reflection coefficient. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so as we come down to, you know, we come away from the the the, the Valhalla of, of infinite bandwidth, and we come back to what we really get, right? Um, you know, we're lucky to have two octaves of bandwidth in a lot of our data. Um, you know, then that's what we're faced with. You know, our, our estimates of, of um, you know, where we really should have no correlation, we're going to have, you know, um, uh, fifty percent correlation. Okay, and so maybe only the really prominent um, reflection coefficients are going to stick out. Uh, so I have a question. So that yeah, top side of the cube. Yeah, that's like one shot record. Right, and that's like a boundary condition that produces everything in the cube, mm -hmm. produces the wave field. Mm -hmm. So, so you have your boundary condition on the top. You go through and you somehow forward model the rest of that cube. That Be because, and, and 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 we'll see how we do this. But remember, um, when we when we were when we were learning about downward continuation, right? Yeah. Given the the, you know, we we put the whole the whole acoustic wave equation into the uh, into the uh, uh, FK domain, right? Into into uh, the frequency domain, and and then as long as we had, you know, one slice through the the, you know, through the um, as long as we have one slice uh, through the cone, we can reconstruct the whole cone. We yeah. can reconstruct the other dimension. Do they do that in this case in the the shot record migration? Or is that only? In yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, what you're seeing here is is precisely, you know, uh, just the uh, the cones, you know, the okay. Huygens cones. Okay, so so they forward model that, and then you get a cube for each shot record, in that case, right? That's right. That's so, right. So you have all these and each shot record has well, each shot record has two two reconstructed wave fields. It's got the source and the receiver. Yeah. Uh, reconstructions. Yep. So, so you have that, right? And then, uh, then it just takes all the slices for all the different x locations and just cross correlates everything. Well, well, you you go records. you go you know obviously look at the front left planes of both of the cubes, right? That's those are x z planes, so they're discretized, yeah. and you have you know ten thousand, ten million um, different. Uh, you know locations x star and z star, and you you for each of those you pick out the time series that extends back into the cube, yeah. and you do the cross the zero lag cross correlation. So you're, you're cross correlating in zt space, right? Which is like basically two different ways of looking at the same thing. The the cor the correlation is only done in t in in time. Oh okay. Okay. Oh, you're just doing it across each of those lines that's extending. To that's the right. Line. That's right. Okay. So for for one x location. It goes through all the different z depths and cross correlates all those time series. 
all, all the different x values, all the different z values, right? There's two nested loops, right? And so, you know, it's it, it may be at this x z pair right here, and and it'll pick up that time series, and it'll pick up the time series from the same x z pair in the receiver. And it'll cross correlate those two, and then it will, you know, here's the reconstructed section, the image i, uh, and and it will. You know, plop that. Uh, you know, if we were looking at an x z pair right here, it'll plop that that coefficient of correlation right down there. In fact, I think it's unnormalized, so uh, it'll just be the uh, what do you call it when it's an unnormalized coefficient of correlation? I can't. I maybe it doesn't have a name. Okay, so for each x location, it'll go through all the times. Yeah. Right. Well, for for okay, we have a we're at, at each at each at each x z pair. So however we loop through it, yeah. we've picked out one location on this front yeah. left plane. Yeah. Okay, and we pick up so so let's take this location right here. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Okay. We pick up this time series, and then the same location in the other wave field is this time series here at the heavy line. Yeah, there, there's a misunderstanding. I, I understand that. That's what I was getting at. Okay. Yeah, so, so it goes across the whole plane, and then it just takes the time series for each of those positions on that plane. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And and we get just one value out of that zero leg cross correlation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, of course, uh, you might be interested to know what the non-zero leg correlations are, both negative and and positive, and so. Um, you know that is one technique is to keep all of those and, and look through them. Okay, and then it just goes through and does that same process for each shot record. Yeah, that's right. All we've done here is reconstruct one shot record when okay. we get down to here. I really wish they would just call it a dot product. Um, it just really doesn't make sense to call it a cross correlation. Yeah, it's because uh, cross correlation is uh, well. Well, first they wanted to leave open the option to look at the non-zero lag uh, dot products, and and also in your in your seismic processing software package, you could find you know there's a module for cross correlation, but there's no module for dot product. And they just take the zero lag part of it. I guess, yeah. To yeah. Specify. Now, whatever you do, you know, if, if you go into open detect and you look, you know, you, you ask for a cross correlation, it will say, okay, what's your what range of lags would you like? You know, minus one second to plus one second. So, so cross correlation is a generalization of the dot product. Totally. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> If you look at the if you look at the the equation you know the integral equation that defines cross correlation you know back from seven oh six and and you uh, you'll notice that that integral just gives you the value at one lag so you just put in zero and 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 what you've got there is a, is an integral that defines a dot product um, yeah it's probably you know, from the first week of seven oh six. Then you have to loop. Yes. I was just including the loop. Yeah. yeah, what we think of as cross correlation, absolutely right. You you loop from uh, uh, you know, some some very small very large negative lag to some very large positive lag. And so it takes uh, you know, th this cross correlation you know, if, if we have nt uh, time samples in these volumes, this this zero lag cross cross correlation takes just nt multiplications. But to get the whole cross correlation um, time series, like you're talking about, um, and that's obvious when we first think about it, right? That's that's nt squared operations. <clears throat> Um, now this doesn't have to be done in um, in the time domain. Um, think about what that zero lag cross correlation would be in the frequency domain. That would be another way to uh, to to do this. This is just that would just be a different implementation of the same thing. 
Okay. So let's see. Uh, you know, uh, WS, this, this time series, WS at that location in, in the time series in terms of T contains one non-zero value right there, red, at x star, z star. Okay? And that's at, you know, let's say that's at one second. WR uh, of t, this along the time series along the heavy line here, has two non-zero values. They're blue and green at the same x star, z star. Okay. Um, and uh, you know the way this diagram was made, that particular x star, z star happens to be on the upper reflector. And and here, see, I was I was uh, way ahead of you. I said the dot product here, right? W S T of T. Um, oh, and I forgot to put a subscript on that. Uh, dotted with W R of T gives non-zero at that reflector. Okay. So then that that dot product W S of T dotted with W R of T at X star Z star gets posted to that location in the X Z image. I of x z. Okay, we correlate all, all the other x z points and we post their non-zero amplitudes. Well, and maybe most of them are going to give zero amplitudes, right? For this simple model, and then we uh, then we we loop through all the other shot gathers. We add in the migrated sections for the other shot gathers, and that's where uh, you know by adding up all of these uh, dot products, right? Where we're we're probably getting you know that's where we're really invoking the uh, uh, the the match filtering you know there's correlation dot products upon dot products upon dot products here and so how can you be really be sure that you're getting uh, that you're getting the actual reflection coefficient right you could believe that that one dot product might might well produce the reflection coefficient. Right, but why should the sum of a whole bunch of dot products produced at the same spot, you know, produce a, that the, the reflection coefficient? And that's you got to go back to to Feynman's idea, okay? Uh, and maybe maybe it is important to to do a normalized sum, right? So so you know, one shot gather at this at this spot at this the x star z star is going to estimate you know a reflection coefficient of 0.05. And then another shot gather represents a reflection, uh, uh, estimates a reflection coefficient of 0.04. Another one represents a, uh, or gives a reflection coefficient of 0.06, right? So you should average them all together. So that's really what we mean by adding them in. We're, we're going to do normalization too. I, I get, I, I'm just figuring that out. Well, here, here <coughs> I guess, wouldn't it make more sense to put the amplitude at the, the x star or z star? That's what we're instead of the whole the dot product of the whole vector. Well, well, okay. So, so again, think simple impulses. Okay. So, so we have a uh, uh, um, um, our our reconstructed source wave field has a an amplitude of uh, uh, you know because it comes from an explosion. It has an amplitude of uh, of three centimeters per second, okay, and then um, um, you look in the receiver wave field, okay, the reconstructed receiver wave field, and that has an amplitude of um, of uh, uh, point uh, oh three centimeters per second, okay, and so then um, the um, Let's see. So the dot product of those two is going to be uh, uh, what? Uh, I'm just taking those two scalars, I guess that's what I was getting at. Instead yeah. Of the dot, instead of the dot product getting put into that spot, it should just be the, the source wavelet right there and the, and the receiver wavelet piece. Just those two scalars in that. Yeah, yeah. That that's what. Oh well, well. Okay, if you really wanted the reflection coefficient, right? What what should you do? You should take uh, 0.03 centimeters per second and divide it by the source amplitude, right? Which is 0.0, uh, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 
and then you would get your point 0.1 reflection coefficient. But that's not what this does, right? This is going to give. Uh, uh, okay, so we know that the reflection co coefficient should be point, point 0.1, right? Um, and uh, and what we get is is point 0.3 times point 0.03, uh, which is uh, point 0.09. No. 0.009. Okay, so we've only got it. Maybe we can't normalize it. We've only got a piece of it. So this is kind of getting to why RTM totally destroys the amplitude. There, there you go. I mean, under these perfect conditions, you can kind of imagine. Okay, so let's say we hit it with, you know, under Feynman's uh, ideas, we hit it from all directions with, you know, 180 different, 180 more shot gathers. Okay, you could imagine all those adding up. You know, you get we got what 0.0 uh, 9, right? Or no, 0 .0, 0 0.09, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, you know, that's 1% uh, of what it should be, right? So you add, you add all the reflection coefficients, uh -huh. and it, maybe it'll give you 0 0.1, right? But, you know, what are the chances of that really working? Not high, right? We haven't even invoked Q in any of this. Oh, oh no, you can, you can do that in the... Um, in the reconstructed wave field, okay. But but we're okay. You're but you're right. We're not inverting it. We're cross correlating. We're dot producting. We're multiplying. Yeah. So so again, this is the tomographic approximation, right? I mean, we should be we should be deconvolving. Instead, we're match filtering. Okay. So tomographic approximation rears its ugly head once again. Okay, we're and we're not doing our proper, our proper, uh, our proper job of uh, of deconvolving. Okay, um, uh, but uh, you know, actually, after after thirty years' experience of this, that doesn't make me nervous at all. I, I would much rather I would much rather cross correlate than than deconvolve. Because cross this 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 you can always do this right. You try to deconvolve and and then you know suddenly nothing works. You know you just hit your spectral holes and everything blows up. But this is always gonna this is always gonna do it's always gonna produce something, right? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this uh, uh, all right. This WSRWR model, as it's called, it's that's due to Burkout in uh, way back in '82. Um, I probably witnessed, uh, you know, Burkout uh, giving this uh, as an SEG talk way back then, and I didn't understand anything about what he was talking about. But I think I saw this. Um, I, I, I'd have to wait till I tried to teach this subject uh, six years later to actually understand anything about it. Um, let's see. Um, you uh, uh, you can see how dependent we're, we are on the source in the scattered wave fields, right? You know whether they include Q. Um, what's the bandwidth? Um, you know uh, how does velocity affect it? Uh, um, you know, is there is there additional scattering? Um, you know, what what's going on? Um, you know, we're 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 we're, we're in, we need those those wave fields. We've got to have a source wave field to carry energy to the reflector. We've got to have a scattered wave field to ca to carry energy away from the reflector. Um, but you know, and, and and Sava and Hill's tutorial doesn't say anything about how we should do this. You know, and there's many, many ways, as he as he does say, as they do say. Uh, now, the the so these these scattered wave the, these source and scattered wave fields they're really a critical part of the process. For two D data, the wave fields are three D, right? They're uh, as we've as we've seen in this tutorial, the wave field is in X, Z, and T. For three D data, you can do the same thing. The wave fields are four D. The wave field exists in x, y, z, and t. Okay, so uh, uh, and and you know the, that's awfully hard to draw, but we can certainly uh, we can certainly compute that. 
That's not a big deal. Um, okay, so so you know here's a summary of 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 what we need for uh, sequential shot gather imaging. Um, we need a wave field reconstruction that generates the source and the scattered wave fields WS and WR uh, at all locations in in space. You know here X and Z and at all times t from data recorded at the surface. All right, so you know that could be as simple as a constant velocity uh, dispersion relation, you know, circular dispersion relation, or you know, you could conceive of using a full elastic, uh, you know, use WP four, you know, in full elastic mode to uh, to generate that that reconstruction. Uh, number two, we need an imaging condition that extracts reflectivity information, <clears throat> you know, which we call the image I. From that, from by combining somehow the reconstructed source and scattered wave fields. Okay, and we've talked about this dot product imaging condition. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about this about this kind of crazy imaging condition. Uh, what we've talked about here is is only a single scattering assumption. Okay. Um, and what's assumed here is that the incident and the scattered wave fields are identical at the scatterer, except for the reflection coefficient. Okay. Um, now, now another reason that that uh, amplitude is is difficult to look for here. Um, if this incident and scattered wave fields are identical at the scatterer, then how are you incorporating the Zopritz equations? You know, or or are we are we assuming there's one, you know, impedance contrast reflection coefficient that has a circular, um, uh, a circular effect? You know, a spherical effect. It's the same no matter what the direction is. Okay, that's uh, that may be worth some thought. Um, this, uh, this imaging principle is only accurate kinematically. It's good for getting timing and structure. It's dynamically uh, ridiculous, actually. Um, you know, it, it gets you a, a poor, uh, uh, a poor uh, reflection coefficient r. Um, it, uh, it doesn't match impedance. Um, it, 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 it really shouldn't be able to give you anything about AVO. Okay, uh, and here's another reason it's dynamically uh, uh, inaccurate. You know, the scattering cannot change wave phase. Um, and where does wave phase uh, change? Well, even in the simplest models, at the top of very diffraction hyperbola, changes by 180 degrees. You know, how do we do that? Um, and and then uh, uh, we need to start thinking about. Uh, uh, you know when we have extra things in the in the data that we didn't uh, you know that aren't covered by the assumptions right such as multiples so multiple reflections you know they're going to be in the uh, um, you know let's say the receiver data have multiple reflections in them so that's going to be extra amplitude that's in the uh, in the shot gather okay and uh, so we're going to have extra cones reconstructed from that extra amplitude, right? And and that gives us more of a chance that we'll get a hit, that we'll get a non-zero um, cross correlation, a non-zero dot product when we uh, when we cross correlate these two these two reconstructed time series. Okay. So what are what are multiples going to do? Um, the multiples are going to give a cross-correlated amplitude that's too high. All right, so they're going to add extra structure. They're going to add additional and unrealistic, um, additional and unrealistic um, uh, uh, amounts to the reflection coefficient. They're going to bias the reflection coefficients upwards. Okay, and certainly add uh, uh, add artifacts as well. You know, obvious artifacts. Uh, hopefully, but maybe not. 
remember, uh, uh, once we do the dot product, we've lost the information about, you know, the fact that the fact that the multiples are are mainly later in time, and they're adding that amplitude from later in time. We've lost that information once we do the dot product. Okay, it's not it's not there anymore. So, so we might get these, you know, we don't know where the artifacts are coming from. We don't, in, in, where in time, in the reconstructed wave fields, they're coming from. Um, we don't know, you know, we could have artifacts that are showing up um, on the very, uh, you know, at, at great depth in the image that are coming from very shallow time parts of the reconstructed wave fields. You know, that, that won't be good either. To comment on this, the timing and structure, the RTM tends to be much lower frequency, narrow, narrower bandwidth. Mm. So sometimes you actually can't see some of the finer structure that would be really important. Right, right. It's better for the maybe the large scale. Okay. So so you know, and and that that low frequency appearance results from results from the cross correlation it results uh, you know even if you even if you apply the row filter later you know it, the, still the process of doing all the, the the summation will do that it results from the 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 velocity model that's probably too smooth it results from the the wave field extrapolations which maybe are are not uh, accurate enough you know if they're fast they're going to be less accurate so all of that you know, makes the RTM val you know more valid at lower frequencies. Um, you know, there's this uh, big issue of the velocity model, um, and I would say that you know this is still an issue for those who have not heard of Satish and his work. Okay, the velocity model has you've got to know it a priori. Um, so, so that's you know the velocity model is basically assumed ahead of time. Um, now, my my take on this is you know in an area where velocities are smooth, okay, um, you know, Texas Gulf Coast away from uh, or or uh, uh, Gulf Coast uh, offshore away from salt domes anyway, where velocities are smooth, then that uncertainty, the velocity uncertainty, will not prevent imaging. Okay. Uh, if you do have strong lateral velocity contrasts, you know, such as Satish might be able to get you, then you you you've got to you've got to do it. You know, if you have a, if you have a salt dome flank, you've got to know exactly how velocity changes and where that salt dome flank is, and how much it's un, it's hung underneath the uh, uh, the bulb at the top of the salt dome. You know that that structural. Uh, part of the velocity model becomes really critical because you're reconstructing strongly refracting way, uh, uh, source and receiver uh, uh, wave fields uh, through those those strong lateral velocity contrasts, and you're going to be you're going to be miles off if you don't have that contrast properly characterized and properly located. Um, so this velocity model is. You know, it's the essential input into whatever procedures you use for generating the wave fields from your sources. Okay, your sources and your receivers. All right. Now, now, one thing that that is is still really unclear is uh, 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 coming up here. Okay, generating the source wave field. All right. Well, that's pretty simple, right? We got that source, we've got the data, which is the source impulse, and we, we generate a, a wave field from that. I mean, and we, we know we've got a whole panoply of methods from, from uh, you know, FK um, using a circular dispersion relationship um, to, uh, 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 to a, full, uh, a full wave run uh, uh, elastic with, uh, with Q and we could incorporate uh, uh, plasticity under the the vibrator. You know, we can do all of that. We know we know we got no problem generating the source wave field. You know, um, 
so, uh, but how do you generate the receiver wave field? Okay, um, we talked about you know taking the hyperbolas and <clears throat> reconstructing them using uh, using a circular dispersion relation. Okay, we know how to do that, but but how do we do it for real? You know, through a more complicated velocity uh, um, uh, model. Okay, and and here's so so here's another layer of approximation on top of everything else that's being done here with RTF. Okay, we're going to simulate each shot ga uh, shot gather traces receiver position as a virtual source at that receiver's true position. And then we're going to uh, uh, we're going to feed each receiver's recorded data into each receiver source as a source time function. So you know, generally when we run E three D or or uh, 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 let's see, I have a a, a simple code, a simple uh, acoustic two D code called uh, a mod. Uh, Okay, that Vidali wrote, uh, um, you know, thirty years ago, and um, and it does a very simple uh, um, solution of the acoustic finite difference equation. At least it's fourth order in in space. Uh, very simple, um, and uh, uh, you can. Um, uh, uh, and you can also use it as uh, as an sh uh, um, as an sh uh, um, uh, wave generator, so it's sh or or acoustic. Um, so uh, uh, you know, generally, uh, this is true of E3D as well. Um, you know, you set off a, a source, and if you want it to be an exploration source, it, you feed it a, a, a rather short and compact. Um, uh, and what's the name of the wavelet? Ricker wavelet. Okay, and then you know the Ricker wavelet is is uh, fairly band limited, so it comes out looking like seismic data. I mean, you could feed it a spike, but you generate a lot of high frequency artifacts too, uh, a lot of grid dispersion. So you feed it this uh, fairly band limited Ricker wavelet, and you get out some stuff, you know, synthetics that look like that look like seis uh, seismic records. Okay. So instead of feeding feeding it the Ricker wavelet, we feed it the recorded data. Okay, and where that receiver was, we put a source in the in the uh, in the A mod run, and we feed the you know all the all the bumps, reflections, surface waves, whatever's in that recorded data set. I mean, we're supposed to have removed all the multiples, removed all the. All the direct waves, all of that is supposed to have been removed. Direct waves removed, um, especially um, shear waves removed. You know everything that that isn't a primary reflection and P wave reflection, we've removed. Okay, so we feed that into the uh, into A mod, into that source at the receiver position. Okay, and that produces a reverse time wave field. Okay, from the data, uh, and it projects the recorded amplitudes back onto the scatters. Now, what you can do, uh, and I and I think I have the code. I call it XA mod. You you have uh, uh, a number of sources going at once. So you have your your shot gather, and maybe you've got uh, data at uh, each of 193 receivers. Okay, and you feed that. You you remove all the direct waves, all the service waves, all that. And uh, you feed each of those in at the same simultaneously, so they they're acting as um, um, as 193 separate point sources at the surface for your same A mod run. So you, for that whole shock gather, you've only got to do one modeling run, and that reconstructs the uh, uh, that whole wave field. All right, and maybe uh, you know you could be even more efficient if you if you um, uh, you know, of course, you're gonna you're gonna make a, a wave field for for your source alone, and then you could do the correlation, uh, you know, right in the A mod program or the X A mod program, um, and and not even have to put out the large uh, wave field volumes. 
So uh, you you do that. To, um, you know, it takes the uh, the data from all from your whole array, your whole shock gather array, and and you know sinks it into the ground that way. So that's how that's the uh, the most popular method of doing the the uh, reconstruction. Um, and of course, uh, uh, a mod x a mod they they require input of a velocity and density model. All right. So reverse time reconstruction. Okay. So this this now uh, you know for this method for RTM, the successful wave field re reconstruction relies on this single scattering assumption. Okay. The recorded wave fields have scattered only once in the subsurface. All right. There's no multiples in the data. And also, and this is where AMOD is not exactly the right program, no scattering occurs in the process of wave field reconstruction. Now, since AMOD is a full acoustic wave equation solution, you know, all of those, uh, the, the, you know, you put that source in, and it's going to reconstruct the whole thing, including all the reflections, you know, and, and uh, and you're going to end up uh, uh, cross-correlating your uh, your um, your uh, your your uh, you know fully uh, uh, you know fully uh, acoustically modeled shot gather against a uh, uh, against the uh, the reverse time uh, reconstruction of the shot gather. Okay. So that's violating this, this requirement here that no scattering occurs in the process of wave field reconstruction. Okay? So, you know, these full wave modeling methods are not going to work well since they always implement scattering with the propagation. Okay? So we built up this method using, you know, very simple, uh, uh, of course, the, you know, if you reconstruct your wave field using the cones, using the the dispersion relation, uh, then there's no scattering. But if you if you reconstruct the the wave fields using uh, full wave modeling, then you're violating this condition that no scattering occurs in the process of wave field reconstruction. So again, that's going to lead to extra amplitudes and artifacts of some kind in the uh, um, in the image in the final image. Um, now, uh, this is why one-way paraxial wave equation modeling um, is pretty popular for this, because it can't create reflections. You know, if you're modeling down, downgoing waves only, you know, you can't make an upgoing reflected wave. You're only, you're only doing, you know, downgoing transmitted waves. Okay? So uh, the paraxial uh, modeling... Uh, uh, works very well. It's also uh, paraxial, as as you've seen, is much faster than full wave uh, model. Um, so uh, uh, now two way modeling procedures can work, so long as they don't introduce that extra scattering. Okay, so uh, uh, you know you can do uh, uh, two passes of downward continuation. You can do. Uh, WKBJ ray tracing. You can use deterministic travel times uh, and convolution. Uh, all those, all those are possible. Um, you know, it just depends on uh, you know when you have really complicated velocities, uh, then you're going to have really complicated wave fields. Um, and and so you know, my warning here is that any modeling method that's capable of handling strong lateral variations. Is also going to introduce scattering, and so these are more reasons that RTM is kinematic and not dynamic. Um, okay, uh, there's there's another uh, you know there's various implementations um, uh, of how and and one of the differences in implementation is how you uh, do the wave field reconstruction. You can have a depth marching method or a time marching method. Um, you're familiar already with depth marching methods, like from the uh, the Omega Mig uh, uh, or, or the Extrap uh, uh, calculations. Those are both in the frequency domain. Um, 
we had the TMIG program, uh, and you could make a T. No, you you made a T mod. You were given a T uh, uh, a time domain extrapolation program, and you had to turn it into a, a migration. So uh, you know those are all downward continuations, and uh, uh, you know so so most of the depth marching methods are. Uh, are praxial wave field extrapolations in the frequency domain. Uh, the time marching methods are mostly uh, reverse time migrations with acoustic finite difference modeling in the time domain, as we've been discussing. Uh, there's also uh, uh, you know, various ways of, of trying to extend this imaging condition. You know, here's, the, uh, here's the basic way, the zero lag uh, uh, cross correlation. Right, which is really just a dot product. Um, so here's basically, uh, uh, you know, I at x y z is is sampling these uh, wave fields at uh, the source wave field and the receiver wave field at this constant x y z, and then it's integrating the 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 uh, the product across all time. Okay, and but that's at zero lag, right? So you can you can put in a lag. Tau, right, and uh, you can also put in space spatial shifts. You can put in a shift in x, a shift in y, lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, and uh, so then you know your uh, your cross correlation. A again, this this one integral here gets you one value that you put in at uh, at this point. But you can make instead of a three D image volume, you can make a what is this? A seven dimensional image volume. That has all these different shifts, um, and uh, why would you do that? Uh, um, right, so you have an image volume i that's seven dimensional. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, but apparently that's used for trials of amplitude versus angle analysis. You know, trying to get towards AVO. I, I don't know whether that ever works uh, given all these assumptions, but maybe there's. Uh, there's been some success with that, in, at least in certain situations. Um, and also, you can determine the wave field reconstruction error. All right, <clears throat> because uh, uh, you know you might be using a one-way low-order uh, wave field reconstruction. You know, just the uh, the first uh, or second Muir uh, <clears throat> square root approximation, um, and then finite differencing. You know, with just two terms or something. <clears throat> so that would be very fast, um, but it's going to result from some, in some error. And so you're going to, you know, that's why you would put in these uh, these spatial uh, lags as well as time lags to try to uh, assess that. Of course, you're going to have velocity error, and that's also going to result in rate, wave field reconstruction error. Uh, you're going to have error from multiples in the data. You're going to have errors from problems with the uh, the acquisition coverage, you know, the, there's uh, the ends of the line, and and uh, and and maybe there's holes in your line, you know, which you're familiar with. Uh, you might also have incomplete subsurface illumination. You know, you you can't, you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at a reflector that's dipping, you might never get reflections off the underside of the reflector, and only from the top side. So uh, uh, you know it's an incomplete subsurface illumination, and and these you can assess all of these through this you know possibly seven dimensional uh, image. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, uh, finish up by by looking a little bit at these uh, at these uh, uh, um, you know more more slightly more realistic examples. Okay, so we're going to follow the same process that. Uh, that we had before. Um, in the data, there's two, two pieces of data. There's the single impulse at the shot location for this uh, shot gather. And on the receiver side, there's uh, the shot gather. So here's a, a shot gather. Obviously, it's, had, uh, it's supposed to have had multiples removed. It's obviously got the, uh, um, it's obviously got the, uh, uh, the direct arrivals removed. Okay. Then we do uh, wave field reconstruction. Okay, so uh, uh, we uh, we generate that that wave field from the the source, 
Um, and, and then also from the shot gather. You know, we, 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 we feed each uh, shot, each uh, receiver in as a source all along the shot gather. Now, this presentation is, uh, is a little bit different from what you would see in, um, uh, like in Open Detect. You're looking at the whole data cube here, except the uh, uh, look at these green dotted lines. Okay, where the green line is, that's what's shown on the on the corresponding face. Okay, so so what's shown on the top of the volume here, that's the wave field down at this green line. Okay, I think this would have been better if they'd actually visualized it uh, volumetrically, but it is hard, very hard to see things volumetrically. Um, so, so you know, because this is the, uh, the the shot was here, and so it should be a triangle if we're truly looking at the top plane, right? But it's it's a it's a hyperbola, and that's because it comes from a non-zero depth. Okay. Now this uh, complex uh, wave field that's from the shot that's at a certain uh, uh, a certain time. Right, so this is a time slice. Well, that's from this green line, uh, halfway back. That's halfway back in time, and this one here on the right-hand side, you know, that's from the green line, which is right in the middle, okay, and showing the uh, the uh, the wave uh, propagating uh, more rapidly with depth. Okay, so that all that all makes sense now. Uh, that's uh, that's our shot uh, uh, side wave field. Now the receiver side wave field. This is reconstructed, and the same idea here. We got the uh, the same the green lines in the same places. So um, this is the uh, reconstruction in time, and you can kind of see, uh, but it's at it's at a certain depth. You know, it takes uh, the waves a while to get down there, and then they kind of, you know, from the the line they kind of focus, and then they spread out again in depth. So this is kind of this just the coverage of that one shot gather. Gives us this hourglass-like shape uh, or evolution in time. Okay, so the waves are coming together, and, and then they they reach a, a point that's, you know, maybe uh, equivalent in in depth to the width of the array or the half width of the array, and then they start spreading out again. Okay, and here's the wave field with depth, but that's at a uh, medium time. So you can see how, you know, the uh, feeding the data in as sources along the surface. Has led to this, you know, we're kind of we're tr kind of trying to focus the data, uh, you know, down onto the reflectors in the center. Okay, now, I can't really see what's going on on the side here, but it's the it's sort of the same story. Okay, so then uh, uh, we pick out uh, we pick out points uh, 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 in x and z, and we uh, we cross correlate in time. So we're cross correlating this. This time series here, with that time series there, and um, and so that is uh, looking right there, and it's you know it's zero everywhere but right here, and so we basically pick up that amplitude right there, and there isn't much. Okay, and that's the image at the uh, the image plane at the bottom. John, is the right side of the cube on the left upside down? Could be, could be. be. Oh, the cube on the left. Yeah, the right side is upside. Uh, let's see. It's right at the shot, so it's got a, it's got a, it's got to be there at zero. T no, it's kind of a refraction, right? It's uh, it's going faster as it uh, as it, as it gets deeper. So that seems normal to me. Right. The sh the shot is at uh, is at the surface at zero time. So that that looks correct. Well, it's it's slower, right? This is taking more time to go a small amount of distance, or a small z, right? So, th so that's the sh slow velocities in the upper part of the section. Yeah, but that's the opposite of the one on the top. Uh, this one here. Yeah. That's all at one depth, though. So it's it's uh, and, and it looks like you know from from this uh, side view here, it looks like there's no 
you know, not really any strong lateral velocity contrast. And so this should be, you know, almost a section of a cone. Okay. So um, that is that is a whole forty-five lectures, and uh, I'm thinking I should let you guys go.